So my guest today is uh, Mr. Aaron Von Frank. He's here. I, know, I saw him online. They do some, him and his, his wife do some foraging and, and some planting and gardening and all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, I figured I'd have him on to, to talk about that a little bit and um, share some of those experiences. So Aaron, thank you for, for coming on. I, I appreciate it. Sure. You gotta mention you gotta mention ducks in the intro, yes. man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> look at that, and he's a a duck enthusiast, um, and, and we will talk about ducks for yeah. a little bit at least. I don't know, I don't know, I, I I don't know a lot about ducks. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll learn. You can. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, we uh, we self describe as duck evangelists. We're big we're big on ducks. Yeah, so we we love the critters. <laughs> They're very good. Uh, we we use them for uh, mostly for egg production and and also for entertainment because they make really good pets and they're kind of hilarious creatures, but. Anyway, right. um, don't want to get derailed from. Hey, I'll, I'll, it's all, all, all good, all in there. Um, when did you guys get ducks? Uh, it's been, uh, I think, like we're at eight, seven, eight years now. Okay. So, and they can live to be like, you know, I think the oldest one in captivity lived to be almost twenty. But you know, they can typically a, a a duck in a you know, non-wild environment it can live to be up to like 13, 14 years old. Okay. Yeah. See, that's, that's 20 yeah. years. That's just like, it's almost too long for me. It's almost too long for me. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. um, did you, uh, you, and your, so how long have you and your wife been, been doing, uh, was it tyrant, tyrant farms, right? Yeah. So just the, the name, just for kind of some context, um, <laughs> is tyrant farm. Um, and my, my wife's a little, she's a little bossy. So her nickname, uh, became the tyrant years ago. And so uh, we started off with kind of a, a garden, like just a typical garden in the backyard sort of thing. And then um, it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And so we have about a half acre and the whole thing's basically a giant organic edible landscape now. So we kind of jokingly named it Tyrant Farms. And um, so yeah, so that's, that's, how that, that's how the name came about. Um, and we've been doing, we started blogging, uh, I think 20, it might've been like around 2010, was probably okay. 2011 somewhere in that, in that time frame. Yeah, just like anything else, you, you, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have a plan for it. We were just kind of, <laughs> and this would be fun. Let's you know write some articles or whatever. Um, and then actually, it sort of became because we're we're also kind of digital marketing. Um, okay. That's sort of our, our profession. And uh, but that wasn't we didn't you know, have a business plan or start off with uh, Tyrant Farms just even thinking of it as a business. It was just kind of a fun side thing to kind of document mm-hmm. stuff we were doing. Um, and now it's actually kind of grown into a, a business and it's, we're much more purposeful about what we do with it and yeah. you know, the, the content we create on it and whatnot. So what, I'm kind of curious about that then, like how long did that process take before you started to kind of really kind of plan things out more or had, had more of an idea like, okay, this is something that um, we can monetize or utilize or, or turn into something more than just like a, a little hobby on the side yeah so it sort of uh i guess it sort of became a purposeful business three years ago uh somewhere in that time frame okay. and that that was largely just you know we were, we were doing stuff for clients and uh and the traffic on the site started doing well and so we were thinking about it well this is interesting let's you know let's kind of monetize what we're doing here because we just had like google you know google ads plugged in it wasn't really mm-hmm. doing anything and then um once you kind of cross thresholds of traffic uh, you can start doing a lot more stuff as far as monetizing what you're doing. So like once you cross, I think 30,000, uh, uh, people per month, uh, then you, we had access to a thing called media line, which is a big ad network. Um, and so they, they basically are, uh, a pool of various kind of blogs. Um, and they, they, they go out and they find the advertisers gotcha. and have like a really great platform. Um, so it really helps. And so like this month, I think, you know, ironically, the, uh, the pandemic's actually, in a sense, good for some, you know, sort of a counter uh, cyclical sector that we're mm-hmm. in, being kind of gardening and foraging yeah. and all this kind of stuff. So the more, the weirder things get out there, the more people want to learn about, you know, oh, I, maybe I should start growing some of my own food or, mm-hmm. you know, foraging or raising ducks or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Um, so I think last month we did, we had like, I don't know, like 170,000 somewhere that people <laughs> on the site, um, which is good for our site. Yeah. Like it's really, you know, as far as the traffic, it's pretty, that's really good. Um, on the flip side of that, what's happening too is so traffic up and then the RPMs, which is basically how much you get paid um, per, you know, per, 
person mm-hmm. on your site is down, obviously, because advertisers like you know, pulling and slashing <laughs> uh, marketing budgets and whatnot. So like, you know, looking back at like, you know, previous years or previous months, RPMs and being like, you know, if we were making that now, yeah. this traffic, you know, we'd be, uh, we'd be like, you know, jumping up and down, but you know, it's kind of one of those things where yeah. we're, we're, we're just, we're just thrilled. Like, you know, it's, it's so tough out there right now. We're just thrilled just to be able to actually generate passive income online yeah. through, a, through a website. And the same thing with, with our other website, growjourney.com, um, which is a certified organic seed company right now, but we're actually transitioning out of the seed business and uh, going straight education kind of based on that. And that's more about like organic no-till gardening and mm-hmm. um, stuff like that. So, Good deal. Anyway. Yeah, that's, it's a, uh, it is wild. It's wild how, I mean, the number of people that I've, I've talked to recently that are just like, just starting to, to put something in the ground or just like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, you know, what should I put in a container or, you know, what, what kind of, I, I don't really want to till up my whole lawn. Like, what do I do? That kind of stuff. It's just, it's, it's really mm-hmm. impressive. Um, how, did you guys, did you grow up with like a, a background in farming, gardening, any, anything like that? Or was this something that you and your wife kind of came about later and, and gave it a go and stuck with it? Yeah. Uh, well, personally, um, I'll, I'll talk about my wife in a second, but I grew up um, in sort of like the wild areas of South Carolina. My parents were professors, uh, but we lived all over the place. We lived in Africa and Europe. And, nice. um, but when we, were, when we were home, we were um, in South Carolina. And so I grew up, you know, I had a family lake house in Lake Santee. And so basically my brother and I were just outside. And like mm-hmm. in the summer, we were just, we just lived outside, mm-hmm. you know, caught fish. <laughs> we foraged black bears, we foraged wild plum. Like, so we basically just, my mom always had a garden. Mm-hmm. Um, she's, she's gotten much more sure. We almost, it's not competitive dynamic, but it's like, you know, as our garden advances, my mom's like, okay, well, I got to up my game in our garden. So mm-hmm. we have like these kind of giant, like, uh, you know, all the family now has these kind of massive gardens and yes. food production. Um, so yeah, I kind of grew up a little bit that way, but I guess, uh, whatever kind of catalyst happened on whenever my wife and I got together and got our own property. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of, and she, she, her background is she's a um, studied biology at College of Charleston and was kind of a lab rat. Okay. And uh, so I guess you could put her in the biologist category. Um, and yeah, you know, we just love, love, uh, we were, we're in an area of the country. I think you're in Georgia, right? Yeah, I'm down in like uh, middle Georgia. Um, okay. So. Um, so we're kind of up in the right at the base of the uh, Appalachian Mountains in Greenville, South okay. Carolina, yep. or on the outskirts of Greenville. And so it's like, an awesome area to yeah. uh, if you're into outdoor living it's like perfect because we have you know mountains you can go up you know hiking everywhere mm-hmm. we have lakes we have you know, creeks and rivers and there's just tons of stuff here so we're constantly outside um and uh you know it's awesome for mushroom foraging and plant foraging it's awesome for uh or just general even if you don't like that stuff yeah. it's a good place to be so. That's nice. That's good. Yeah, I, we lived in in Augusta in like 2010. So, I yeah. I think I've been up there a couple times actually for some some running stuff. But um, so you uh-huh. you uh, you did the garden thing. When um when did you start to I guess how much how much foraging did you do then? Like you were I, you mentioned blackberries as a kid, um, and I know you guys do mushrooms and stuff now. Um, yeah. How did that filter in? Was that something that cause I feel like they almost like should run in tandem, right? If you like have a, a big garden, like you're more aware of what vegetables and what plants are out there, what fruit is out there that growing wild that's, you know, you can eat. But um, sometimes I, I guess that's not always the case. I'm just kind of curious how you guys fell yeah. into that. Well, yeah, she's also kind of warned that there's obviously plenty of plants yeah. and fungi <laughs> that will that, that will kill you or make you sick or what you're going to say, like, don't go out in the forest and just eat a mushroom because you know, <laughs> somebody might listen to this podcast. That's a that's a really good way to, to experience kidney failure. Um, so we like to know how things work, mm-hmm. um, and I don't really think you can kind of understand uh, soil microbiology or forest ecosystems or any of this stuff, or even agriculture, unless you have sort of a basic understanding of, you know, of fungi and what, what it is, yeah. this role in the ecosystem, mycorrhizal fungi and whatnot. Um, and in the case of a lot of the forage mushrooms, they're 
a lot of times they're superbic or even parasitic, like chicken of the woods. Or, right. So basically they, 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 they serve, there's all these different types and they all serve these different roles. Some of them are decomposers, some of them are kind of hunter scavenger almost <laughs> as far as looking for, <laughs> for dying trees that they can then eat. Um, and then a lot of them are mycorrhizal, which are, you know, like chanterelles and things and morels, things like that. And they form, um, you know, these symbiotic uh, relationships with trees right. and they kind of coat the tree roots. And then they, the fruiting body that you see is sort of, almost like an apple on a tree. It's a very small part of the organism. Mm -hmm. um, but we really got into it. Uh, so we started, I think you're probably familiar with Ted and Ted.com and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we started um, TEDx Greenville, which are like the independent TED events back in 2010 okay. um, with some other people here. And uh, one of the speakers that um, people nominated and who, who we've since become friends with is a guy named Chad Cotter. He's okay. a mycologist out of Clemson and he's got a thing called Mushroom Mountain. Okay. Uh, he and his wife are awesome people. Uh, and Mushroom Mountain is basically this giant mushroom farm. In Mul nice. you know, so you can buy like spawn kits. And all they sell mushrooms, I think like Whole Foods and places like that. Okay. But they also um, want other people to kind of cultivate mushrooms as well. Yeah. And they do foraging stuff and foraging classes. Um, so his presentation kind of turned me on to it and then, or us onto it. And then uh, probably for me with like Paul Stamets, yeah. who's like, you know, similar type of guy. He's just like, just this you know, massive amount of you know, knowledge and kind of uh, things, application for mushrooms, yeah. everything from bioremediation to like, you know, crazy stuff like insect pest yeah. control and, um, and also, also I would say like a high protein superfood. Um, so uh, I think 2010 was, you know, that was, that was the year that Trad did his presentation uh, for Zetetics Greenville. And after kind of talking to him and watching this presentation, we're like, this is something we really need to get into. Um, so we started off, you know, with like the basics, like morels yeah. and oyster mushrooms and stuff like that, kind of things that are pretty hard to mistake. There's not a lot of poisonous lookalikes right. or not. Um, and kind of scaled up, I think there's probably like, I don't know, never actually counted, but probably about 20, 20 different species of mushrooms that would forage throughout the year. Okay. And just like plants, mushrooms are seasonal. So there's certain things that come up. In spring there's certain things that come up in summer there's certain things in fall and winter mm -hmm. and so it's you know it's cool like in gardening or foraging there's um you look at the world totally differently um than you do if you don't do these things because you're so much more tapped in and connected to the cycles of uh of the seasons yeah so it's um you know you hear about seasonal eating and so uh you know it, there, there's something to it. There's something, there's a beautiful kind of rhythm to it. So you get to life where it's like, you're always looking forward to, you know, yeah. next month, you know, pop balls are going to be right Or You know, now lion's manes are going to be out. And so you're always, you're all, there's always something cool and new and, and uh, kind of coming along. And there's just sort of this rhythm that you get to, to life that comes about from that relationship. It's really neat. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, definitely true. You think about that with like the garden and, and what food you're getting out of the garden and, and, what food you almost crave, right? Like in, in the fall, you know, you're yeah. looking forward to some of the, the winter squash and, and that sort of stuff. And in the spring, you know, it's the lettuce and the, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's curious how that, how that works. Um, yeah. and I think too, with the mushrooms, like that's, that's one of the things. And when you, when you start foraging, you start paying attention to your, your surroundings and you start like knowing where things are and, you know, being able to identify, different types of trees and different types of habitats and, and stuff, you know, cause at least at some of those mushrooms, they grow with certain types of trees, you know, and you start to figure out all that stuff and it does, it gives you a, a much deeper rooted connectedness, I think to, to everything around you, which for me, I think is, is a healthy way to go about things. But, um, yeah. So you do some foraging down there as well. You have, you have some good spots. When we lived up in Vermont, um, I did a lot down here. Um, I, I, don't find much other than a, a few like um i don't know i forget the name right now the little yellow uh slimy bullets um uh, some sort of oh. liver thing or something i don't know i don't, I don't know <laughs> like, I, I can't remember the common name right now um you know there's about the red the red and uh the red the red caps with the yellow um, no, no, it's like a slimy it's they i don't know um i'll figure it out and then Oh, which is, is a witch's butter, maybe. I don't know. There's, there's, uh, yeah. there's, I don't know. I can't, I can't remember. Okay. We, you know, there, and there's a few, like, there's oysters here and there. And once in a while, you'll find, like, a lion's mane or something. But um, when I was up in Vermont, it was just, like, nonstop, always stuff, like, popping up. Mm -hmm. And and just, I remember, like, I would, I, I would 
run and I'd go on trail runs and stuff. And in the spring and in the, the fall, it was always tough because I'd always like stop and want to look at these no, mushrooms, you know, but I would, well, I'd, I'd like know where I was going and I'd be like, okay, well I can come back tomorrow or later today with a bag and I, and I can grab all this stuff, you know? And, um, yeah. have you guys ever got, got sick eating mushrooms? No, absolutely not. No, there's no reason to ever, mm-hmm. you know, I would say it's like driving a car. You have to kind of learn the rules and then, you know, but it's actually a lot safer than driving a car because you should yeah. absolutely, you'll, you'll still occasionally get in a wreck if you drive a car just because there's other people on the road that you can't control their behaviors. Yeah. But with, with mushrooms and stuff, there's absolutely no reason you should ever, ever eat something that you've, you know, if you don't know what it is, essentially don't eat it. Yeah. You know, if you're not hundred percent confident uh, what it is. And the other thing too is you know, you, you, the first time you eat something, uh, <laughs> you know, people have weird food allergies. So don't like, you know, yeah. Whether it's, I mean, people are allergic to, to chicken eggs, people are allergic to peanut butter, you know, so you never know. And we're, thankfully, we're not allergic to really anything that I know of as far as in the food category. Mm-hmm. So we don't have to be super vigilant about that, but a lot of people that are might really want to start. Um, I mean, there's even people that are allergic to like shiitake, which are really common uh, yeah. mushroom that you can get in the grocery store. Yeah. But it's a very small percentage of people. It's like 5% or something like that or even less. Okay. But bottom line is, you know, first time you eat something, don't go eat like two pounds of it. <laughs> Um, eat, you know, just eat a small amount, see how your body reacts to it, and then, yeah. then take a deeper dive from there. Um, but no, we've never, no, no plant or, or mushroom or anything that we've ever eaten in the wild has ever made us sick. It's just not, we just, because we just don't take risks. It's not worth, yeah. uh, food is not worth dying for. We love food. And, uh, yeah. That important. Yeah. It's a, it, I think it's, that's one of those curious things because I think people, when you tell them that, right, like that, okay, when you eat the mus- this mushroom for the first time, like just, try a little bit and see how it affects your system. And people are kind of put off by that. But when you think about like, you can buy a five pound jar of peanut butter in the store and like, that'll kill some people, you know, like it's yeah. it really, we have this kind of skewed view of, well, I'm, I'm getting it in the store. It comes wrapped in plastic. So it, it's going to be okay. But you think about all the allergies that people have to, you know, conventional food. Um, yeah. I don't know. And there's also risk associated with every single thing that you do. Mm-hmm. Like, you yeah. know, so you think about it and kind of numerically there's on a percentage basis. Yeah. Peanut butter, you know, there's a, there's a risk with that. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, the food that you, or, I mean, there's so many foodborne illnesses that you pick up from like, you know, there's all these romaine recalls or what, you know, what lettuce, whatever happens to be. So, yeah. um, and then on the flip side of that, if you go kind of with the completely sterile, um, kind of highly processed foods yeah, yeah you're, you're not going to get uh, a food board pathogen from that most likely but you're going to be extraordinarily unhealthy yeah, <laughs> so yeah. That, that's a risk yeah. you know uh, do you want to have uh, diabetes and heart disease and obesity and all this other stuff so um you know there, there's sort of you have to kind of look at the big picture of things and say like what what type of person do i want to be mm. uh do i want to be a healthy human being do i kind of identify that way um and do I want to kind of be, have an outdoor life and kind of be active? And so for us, mm-hmm. this, this whole kind of thing that we're in makes a lot of sense for us. And we, as a result of that, it's the knowledge, it's a much more knowledge intensive uh, lifestyle, yeah. right? Like I don't, if I just go to the grocery store for all my food, I don't really have to know much mm-hmm. about anything. I just go and, you know, someone else has got that knowledge and that's, I'm kind of depending on that, which yeah. is perfectly fine. I'm not insulting that at all. Yeah. And if you live in New York City, it's not really the only <laughs> option. Um, but you know, for us, given where we live, given our interests, given the type of humans that we identify as, um, it makes a lot of sense for us to to do these things. And as a result, it requires our knowledge base to increase, and requires us to kind of assess risk differently than most people would otherwise do that are yeah. uh, consuming food. So. Yeah. Yep. No. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I think as long as you pay attention and, and aren't willy nilly picking things up and, and eating them, you're, you know, you're pretty safe. It's, uh, yeah. I don't know. But. We also cook, cook the mushrooms too. And Paul Samus talks about that. So like, uh, you get a lot more nutrition from them and also kind of pretend, any potential pathogens and a lot right. of the, 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 the compounds, the protective compounds in certain mushrooms that might, you know, give you a little bit of uh, GI distress or something like that. Yeah. Because mushrooms don't necessarily want to be eaten. Their function, they're just trying to reproduce. So it's not like they're here to uh, yeah. eat humans. Um, and they have compounds that try to, just like anything else does, that you know, uh, <laughs> might might cause you some, some distress for certain species. But when you cook them, you break down the cell walls, you do all this, you know, this compounds, those molecular compounds are kind of broken apart and whatnot um, and unlocked. And so it's, it's a much, much safer. And then, you know, let's say that, 
So bottom line, don't eat raw mushrooms. Um, <laughs> is another is another tip that yeah. people say. If you just you know, in certain things you can't eat like morel. If you eat it raw, it's going to make you sick. Mm -hmm. um, and but it's a perfectly, it's a, one of the most common like you know sought after gourmet yeah. mushrooms out there. You can go buy them from Whole Foods for like fifty dollars, six dollars a pound. <laughs> um, you wouldn't just pick it up and eat it raw in Whole Foods, right. and you'd be cooked. Um, so anyway, yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you. Things you got to learn if you want to do this stuff. But it's, uh, mm. I think it's you know it's people might from the outset kind of view it as like you know that's too much to learn i don't feel like doing that um i think it's like anything else where it's just like you know as you kind of every year you learn something yeah. new um and then or every month every week whatever it happens to be um and so over time i mean that, that knowledge that it's kind of compounds and so after like five years you you look up and you're like oh, actually know a decent amount about stuff yeah and the, the point the key I, I ideally you get to a point where you know enough that you realize you don't have anything and then you kind of that's when you know you're starting to get somewhere yeah so. yeah it's it is it's it's a uh, you can't learn it all in one season <coughs> you know it takes oh, <coughs> it takes a few years to kind of figure things out but it's it's little steps you know it's learning like some of them are, are very recognizable, you know, learning like a, a lion's mane or something or, or what yeah. Moulin looks like, like that's, you know, and then if you want to get into, you know, some of your mushrooms, it might have something that it looks a little more akin to it, you know? Um, but I don't know. So, uh, I'm kind of curious, you guys so you, you're, are you on about a half acre? That's how big your, your growing space is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we kind of have, um, are you familiar with like a food forest or forest gardening that that concept from company? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, is that is that kind of what you guys have set up? Yeah, so it's uh, I guess it's been popularized. Uh, the the word food forest or forest gardening has been kind of popularized in permaculture circles. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we like permaculture; I think it's a great a great philosophy. Um, but it's, it uh, obviously predates the term permaculture by about ten thousand years or more. Um, so it's basically just setting up perennial ecosystems that are kind of heavily food producing. So, um, you know, like a, a perennial is pretty low maintenance. That could be anything from like asparagus mm -hmm. at sort of the ground level to, and mushrooms. We, you know, we actually do a lot of cultivated mushrooms as well. Um, then all the way up to kind of the, the canopy or overstory layer, which is things like, you know, hickory nuts or pawpaws or, um, chay, chay fruit, which is like a, it looks like a raspberry it grows on a tree, but it tastes like a watermelon um to mulberries to peaches to you know so there's all this different stuff you can grow uh in a perennial ecosystem um so we have yeah that's kind of what our yard is it is also um i mean we live in a somewhat regular neighborhood just sort of on the outskirts of Greenville, so we do have to pay attention to aesthetics and so our front yard is kind of edibly landscaped it looks just like a big flower garden but like there's probably i don't know i think we grow on our yard maybe something that, throughout the year maybe like 200 and 60 300 different edible species of plants um so it's you know, it's really densely planted mm -hmm. um, with all kinds of weird stuff so our neighbors are constantly uh, you know well when when we're not on uh restrictions as far as yeah. how close we can get to one another um you know the kids the kids are always ever looking at ducks and Good you know, asking if they can eat some strawberries from the yard or you know whatever happens to be and you know, so people are, are curious about this and that and what the other thing what is it and mm -hmm. you know we, you know, we We'll make something like a, you know, elderflower cordial, which tastes awesome and share it with neighbors and whatnot. And our offer, it's nice to our neighbors down the street, like that we can see from our front yard. They're really into beekeeping. Okay. Um, so I think they have like five hives in their yard. Nice. So, you know, he started scratching his head and it's like, huh, oh, maybe, uh, maybe these guys want to have some <laughs> beehives. They now have beehives in our, in our backyard and kind of near the forest line. Yeah. And um, apparently that beehive is doing you know, it's just one hive, so but we're we're kind of uh, we feel good about it. He says it's healthiest hive, so we're, we're stoked about that one. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so we offer with the flowers. You know, the flowers are a crop in the sense mm -hmm. that there's a lot of edible flowers, but also the bees are out there constantly foraging on the flowers, and so they get honey out of it. So yeah, it's nice. Yeah, so what do you guys grow then in your? I guess in the in the back part of things, or how how do you have it set up? Um, so there's a little, yeah, there's, a, when, when you start getting into the, the permaculture side of things, there's kind of a, you know, it's not just put things wherever there's, there's a method to it. Um, so mm -hmm. what is, what does that kind of look like uh, for you guys? 
Yeah, so we have um, we have sort of designated annual plant beds, you know, things for like the stuff like the tomatoes and the peppers and the, mm -hmm. the, the stuff that's kind of in and out really quick, uh, or lettuces and kales and things like that. So we have those, those are sort of designated spots that so we're kind of um, constantly swapping stuff out. Um, but then kind of mixed mixed in or between those areas, we have more of the perennial beds. Um, and so like, I guess the back of our property is more like pawpaw and the back's kind of near a forest and there's nothing back there other than we go out there in mushroom forest, but we don't, okay. it's not ours and it kind of goes down to a creek and all this different stuff. But um, back there we have mostly kind of pawpaws, uh, elderberries, blackberries, raspberries, um, the big chay tree, I'm trying to think what else is back there. <laughs> um, service berries, uh, chestnuts, I'm kind of looking out the window right yeah. now. Trying to <laughs> What else back there? Um, figs, peaches, pomegranates. Uh, oh, another one of my favorite greens is um, stinging nettles. It has some really nice stinging nettle mm -hmm. patches. Um, and <laughs> Cultivating people, stinging. Yeah, man, that is one of the best greens. I, I, I don't know how many pounds of stinging nettles we've eaten this year. Stinging nettle pesto and stinging nettle soup. And sting, anything you can think of, stinging nettle. Um, but it's, you know, it's, that's also a perennial. So you mm. just plant that stuff and it can sort of take over, uh, you know, sort of like mint that it crawls everywhere, yeah. but, um, you can also kind of keep it contained, but it's, uh, I think it's like maybe the highest protein, uh, veggie on the planet as far as just like kind of per gram, wow. um, uh, you know, based on dry weight. So it's, a uh, and it's super nutrient dense. And so it just makes you feel awesome to eat it. Yeah. Um, we have, we have a bunch of that, um, uh, Let's see what else is back there. Uh, plum trees. And we also have a couple of you know, beds back there and some asparagus is encroaching into. Mm -hmm. um, and then our front yard is again a lot of flowers. A ton of flowers. Um, and then also we, we do have perennials mixed in there. We have um, some, one of my favorites is uh, we have dwarf feed persimmons. And so we get okay. like loads of giant persimmons in the fall off those. And they're really pretty little landscape trees. Yeah. They sort of have this bonsai structure to them. Um, obviously, being in the southeast, tons of blueberries, high bush blueberries. Um, I think in Vermont, you guys have we had a most ton. Of the yeah, lots of blueberries. The, the short, the little short guys there, like the low, I think the bush. Uh, yeah. It depends on on who's. I mean, most of them are, are you know, you, you can have smaller. There are some smaller ones. What place we used to go to pick them would have, you know, they'd be as tall as I was. Some of them. Um, yeah, okay, those were high bush. I mean, it was. I think it. I, I can't remember. It, high bush come down. They grow better down here than the the regular low bush ones, right? Yeah, I mean there are okay. the wild. There's some wild ones that are like you know, yay big around here that have like really small little berries okay. on them. But I remember when I was kid, we went up to Canada, um, like Nova Scotia, and there was outside the hotel room. There's this like kind of wild field, and my brother and I of course okay. went out there. We're like, oh, we kept because we we never seen the really small blueberry place right. before. But there was this field of of blueberry bushes and the, the things like literally like that big, but they had these nice big blueberries on them. They were absolutely delicious. And so they spent like half a day out there eating. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those, if you're out in the woods or whatever, that's what you'll find. Um, but in terms of, mm -hmm. of cultivated berries, that's, um, how, how long did it take you guys to, to get all that together, to get all those trees and stuff? Was it something you did over time? Was it something you just one year threw a bunch of money in the ground back there and, uh, you know, yeah, a little bit of both. Um, I think about maybe eight years ago, we, we kind of put in a big effort to plant a bunch of perennials. Mm -hmm. and But it, it's constantly shifting. So like, you know, like one year, for instance, uh, maybe three years ago, we're like, this isn't a great spot for one of those elderberries because it was this giant tree and mm -hmm. it was kind of growing into a blueberry patch. We didn't want it. So we you know, took that out. And so it, none of this stuff is really permanent. Like you can shift plants right. around. You can you know, dig things up, move them, you can take them out, whatever it happens to be. So it's, it's always a work in progress. Um, <laughs> and yeah, but yeah, you know, obviously like some of the stuff I, I don't really want to mess like a, a, a blueberry bush if it's performing well, right. but not, I'm not, I believe that sucker alone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it shifts from year to year. Um, so it's always a kind of a, a process of, okay. especially when you're considering aesthetics in a neighborhood, you have to kind of, yeah, you're today that might not look so good do you do you have um have you run into any any issues with that sort of stuff neighborhood you know, like type stuff like neighbors or whatever yeah um no actually nobody i mean everybody kind of uh that we've talked to at least you know who knows what you say <laughs> about, um, uh, likes it you know kids kids love it kids are constantly coming yeah, around yeah. um 
and uh, you know, the, it's definitely a different type of yard mm-hmm. than our neighbors have. And, and our beekeeping neighbors absolutely love it because yeah. they're like really into. They don't know how to grow food other than honey, but they appreciate the fact that we're not using any synthetic right. uh, chemical, whether it's fertilizers or pesticides. They, they kind of understand the the ecological effects of that stuff. Um, but no, we have in the H. We we have an HOA, but it's as long as you're paying your dues, nobody really cares. Um, <laughs> Just right. make sure to pay our dues and everybody's good with it. Good it was funny. I think there was actually when we first moved in, there was like a no chicken rule. Okay. Um, in the HOA, uh, and like somebody I think even had to like years before we moved in had to get rid of their chickens. But we have ducks. So we're yeah. You know, yeah. We're, we're good. <laughs> started, started that rule. Well so. done. So um, yeah, how do ducks fit in? Do you, how many ducks do you guys have? Uh, I think we have. Uh, let's see here. So we, we have six right now. We have five hens and, okay. a, and a drake. So, okay. Um, and the drake, the drake, we kind of keep that. They, they run around the whole backyard all day. And we have a fenced in backyard, so like predators can't get up, right. they can't get out. We have a, a, coop, a couple coops we put them into at night. Um, <clears throat> and then at night we let them out uh, when we're outside, so they get to forage the mm-hmm. front yard and add a little bit of fertilizer here and there. Yeah. With, uh, what kind of what, what kind of ducks are they? Uh, the Welsh Harlequin, they're okay. a breed, a heritage breed from, um, well, Wales is how they're called Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're bred from uh, Khaki Campbells and, uh, I should know this, there's another another breed, um, but they're bred by a, a, a British Army captain who's kind of a eclectic, wild, wild, funny guy, yeah. um, kind of a genius, who, um, so he had something like, I want to say like 1,500 ducks on his estate or something like that. He, he bred these things and uh, like, you know, they're really beautiful animals. Mm-hmm. They're kind of uh, light kind of white feathers with some speckling on them. They have these really beautiful uh, blue wing bars. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're, they're it's kind of visually stunning when we post pictures of them. People are always commenting about how pretty they are. Um, and then the drakes, which are the males, look pretty similar to a wild mallard. They have, depending on their on the season, because they also uh, have different kind of phases of plumage they get through throughout the year, but they have a lot of times we'll have the green head, the kind of classic mallard green head. Mm-hmm. It's a little white stripe and then the kind of uh, decorative bodies because the males, a lot of times in, with, with ducks and other uh, wild critters, the males, the ones have to look pretty for the females. Yeah. So they have the, the nice colorations on them. Yeah. 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 I, I, I hear you. So um, do you guys just raise them for, for eggs and, uh, I don't know, help in the garden? Yeah, okay. um, they're highly entertaining. So there's definitely an entertainment factor to it, but that's that's sort of a tangential, I guess, uh, function. Um, yeah, the, so we get a lot of duck eggs are awesome. I don't know if you ever had them, but they're they're bigger than chicken eggs. Uh, I think like the average duck egg is like 2.5 ounces, which would okay. be like a you know whatever like a jump. It's like the largest chicken egg mm-hmm. you'd find. Um, they're more nutritious as far as the kind of nutrient dense, uh, the various vitamins and minerals, whatnot, are higher con- concentrations, and they also um, my opinion, they just taste better. Um, I, I like chicken eggs. So yeah. I don't mind them at all. But they sort of have a chicken eggs sort of have a sulfury um, flavor, and duck eggs are more kind of a creamy flavor. Hmm. And um, they also have a higher yolk to white ratio. Okay. So um, if you have, you know, like we have friends that are in gourmet chefs and whatnot, they 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 invariably um, prefer duck eggs to chicken eggs, um, whether it's in baking or desserts or okay. any of that stuff. It just makes a, a richer, creamier kind of more flavorful end product, whatever it is you're making. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, you get nice, have a- we've, we've thought about it a few times. Um, my issue always is kind of boils down to the water. Um, you know, and, and I know we, and we have a, we have two ducks. Somebody gave us two ducks. They were supposed to go in the, the pot and um, my kids kind of got stuck. to them. So now we have two drakes that um, just, kind of don't do anything but um the pool is the issue right because i'm always like dumping it out it stinks they don't you know they 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 just smell like there's a smell when you go over by the the duck area um so what what am i what am i doing wrong what do i need to do how do i how do i fall in love with ducks so two things um and this is actually a funny thing about you know our, our blog that we were talking about is one of our most popular articles is um how to build your own backyard self-cleaning duck pond. Um, so you can just Google that uh, if you're curious. And um, so we had, you know, same thing where we had the duck pond, the little, you know, the, yeah. 
whatever, plastic pool. Plastic yeah. kind of whatever, and then it's makes it just make it a mess. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you know, what the hell? We got to do something better than this. Um, and so we spent a lot of time kind of reading and doing research because we also didn't want to have a like a chemical pool where our ducks right. are swimming in chlorine and whatnot. Um, and so uh, we basically built a 1,200 gallon in ground pool using it. It's called a Skippy Biofilter filter system. It was basically just used filter material um, and then plus natural uh, pond bacteria um, that you inoculate the filters with. Hmm. And then the, the bacteria um, basically uh, the, the filters filter out the solids, the bacteria breaks down the solids and eats it. Um, and then you're, and then it kind of goes down, the water goes back down a waterfall. And so it aerates the pond. And so we don't do anything. Um, mm-hmm. It smells perfectly fine back there. The water's uh, clean. Um, I mean, I wouldn't go back there and drink the pond water, <laughs> um, but it's, it's, um, you know, probably is cleaner, cleaner than the, you know, the kind of the wild spring bed creek behind our house. Yeah. And uh, as far as the, ground goes a lot of times you know ducks will make kind of a muddy mess of things because they're ducks mm-hmm. um we, we use mulches and you know uh pine shavings and whatnot so basically keeping the ground where it's it's got uh you know wood chips and mm-hmm. things on it like that really reduces that so actually our backyard even though it has ducks in it all day has zero smell and the pond is not something we ever mess with Good. So, good, it's all different. good deal. I have to, I have to look at that. I'll put a, a link to that in the, the show notes as well, alongside everything else. But um, so, you yes. what, do you run into any problems with with ducks in your garden beds? Um, I know like, I have chickens, and when they get out, uh, they just they destroy things. You know, they, they scratch mm-hmm. in. They're eating all the the brassicas and stuff, and eating ripe tomatoes and zucchini and everything. They just destroy it. The whole garden. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> do, do ducks do that? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you let them. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're really good foragers. Um, so we, in our annual beds, as I mentioned, we have fence, fencing around them. Mm-hmm. So even when we let the ducks out, they can't kind of get into those spots. Yeah. So we let them, if we let them into our lettuce and kale and chicory patches and whatnot. Okay. That, that would be, uh, they'll go after what, all that. Yeah. What wasn't eaten looked like it was you know, hit by a tornado. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, the ducks can't go in there, but you know, okay. as far as like the, the perennial plants, um, I mean, actually our, our biggest, almost like too big peach tree in our, is in our backyard. It's a hundred percent duck fertilized. Nice. Um, and that sucker is like, I mean, duck can't do anything <laughs> to that. So it's, uh, and they're also, you know, they're, they're, they're not flighted birds. So right. they, they can't, they can't fly. So like, even if they could, I don't think they could be like fly up and grab a peach and bring it back down to the ground. <laughs> Um, but you know, so this, they can't, they can't do anything to this point with blueberries, all that stuff, you know, persimmons that we, we have a bunch. So the backyard is largely, uh, that they spend all day in is largely kind of perennial fruit trees, mm-hmm. um, or, or cane berries, like blackberries and raspberries. Mm-hmm. So all, all they're doing is foraging around that stuff. And frankly, probably eating a lot of pest insects that would mm-hmm. otherwise or slugs or snails or, uh, ticks or you yeah. know, all this different stuff that the ducks eat. Um, and so all they're doing in that situation is adding fertility to the soil, um, which rather than kind of washing through the soil system and going into our Creek has been kind of, you know, eaten by the consumed by the plants, yeah. which then drop leaves back on the ground and which then refertile. So it's basically this kind of constantly cycling nutrients and then we get fruit out of the whole process. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. It's a, it's a good system. It's a good system. So, yeah. um, all right. I don't, I don't keep you too long. Um, any, any, words of advice for, for people out there thinking about, um, getting started in, in sort of a more permaculture sort of way in a, in a more perennial, um, you know, not necessarily, you know, till it up and, and plant it every, you know, season. Um, so it's looking for something a little more, more permanent where, where can they get started or. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's a few different, it's kind of funny. We got, interviewed by USA Today like last week about this very, very thing. <laughs> and it, it's very hard to give blanket advice to everyone right. everywhere about how to start something. Um, and I, and, but I mean, it's still important to try to distill that down in a, in a way that's digestible for people. So they're like, yeah, but a few things start small, um, being like, don't, don't try to plant an acre of land at once. Mm-hmm. If you've never done anything like that before, um, it's a very good way to get overwhelmed and kind of give up and have, not very good success. Um, and that could be, you know, depending on what your living situation is, if you're living in an apartment, that could be a couple you know, pots in your window yeah. or on your balcony, whatever it happens to be. Um, 
start past. So sort of the agile development and software terms is basically, you know, you're, you're constantly doing little things uh, on a daily basis even, and then you're getting instant feedback from, from that or instant in terms of plants might be a couple months, but you're, and then you're learning and you're not expecting, you know, uh, you're not, you're not basically doing something that you're not going to see the result from in, in, for one or two or three or five years. Right. You're kind of um, moving quickly um, in, in small fashions in order to kind of get, um, to get experience, to get kind of feedback, to learn, oh, I did that wrong or I could do that better or this didn't quite work out. Why did that happen? Um, and then, you know, there's things, you know, permaculture, uh, no-till organic gardening, um, uh, agroecology. There's lots, lots of names for these different kind of, broad fields mm-hmm. are sort of there's a lot of overlap between them um or in square foot gardening if you have you know not much land and you want to really grow a lot of food on that land that is a good area to look at that just kind of helps you understand the kind of the dimensionality for space right. where you know, if you're growing everything on a flat surface then that's going to yield only x amount of food but if you start putting in sort of you know trellises and and other things and you can start to kind of really ramp up the ramp up the production on your spot um but bottom line is like, you know, it's like anything else that you've ever been become good at in life. Like you didn't start that way. You sucked at it at first. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you just kind of kept going and um, became interested in it and learned more, you know, year by year by year, month by month by month. And then you look back and you're like, damn, I'm pretty good at this. Uh, <laughs> and then yeah. that, that's how it happened. But, you know, obviously never, nobody starts that way. Right. Like, I, mean, I don't yeah, so that, that that's 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 something is just to kind of like, start small, start fast. Um, don't worry about like you're gonna you're gonna kill plants. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, one of our one of our really good friends who's like an awesome, probably you know one of the better gardeners and more knowledgeable people we've ever encountered, uh, has a funny saying that you you don't know a plant until you killed it like seven times. <laughs> so yeah, I mean you're gonna kill a lot of plants. Don't worry mm-hmm. about it. And, and unfortunately, you no. Know, we hope that doesn't apply to uh, to ducks and chickens and whatnot because yeah. you know, a little, little different situation with sentient animals. You probably want to be a little bit more careful about your uh, yeah. taking on that responsibility. But with plants, you, you cannot feel as bad if uh, <laughs> your mishap leads to their demise. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that it's that's an important thing to to remember. You know, when you when you look on YouTube, when you look in magazines or wherever, like you see these these setups that have who knows how long, how many years they've taken to, to get to that point. And they're just so well manicured. And when you start, that's, that's not what it's going to be. That's not how it's going to happen. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody has setbacks and then it doesn't matter how long you've been doing things. You you still end up killing something here and there. Um, you know, and it's, and that's okay. It's all part of the process. And in the end, you're further ahead than you were when you started. So but, yeah, uh, you got some. Um, I mean, that's that's the awesome. Like, the, it literally is the fruits of your labor. So it's kind of mm-hmm. cool to yeah. to um, be able to eat. You know what you've what you've kind of planned and thought through and you know grown. And it's it's, a, it's such a rewarding experience to you know put that stuff on your table. <laughs> really, yeah. really, really, truly is. Um, but all right, <laughs> if uh, if people where where can they go to find you? Um, where's your um, what you got yeah, going we on? We have there? two two websites. Uh, I guess our personal blog is um, tyrantfarms dot com, <clears throat> and our, uh, our our other one, website, which is kind of in transition right now, is growjourney dot com. So okay. they're very similar as far as the, the the nature and the educational resources on them. But I guess uh, either one of those is, is perfectly fine. All right, now with with growjourney dot com, you mentioned that you're trying to transition that to more of a educational program or something mm-hmm. what what is yeah uh, currently it's a um it's a usda certified organic uh, seed company so it's, it's just, it was a subscription service it still is a subscription service um but we really just want to go kind of product free and just go purely kind of service based mm-hmm. as, as far as the business model um and the service being just educational resources and good content from um so we kind of have a handful of uh really knowledgeable uh, I guess food growers that we're working with to, okay. um, and we're, we're all to, to, to write and create content for that, for that website to kind of help people learn how to do a lot of this stuff. Okay. Uh, that we're, that we've Good been deal. talking about here today. Good deal. Good deal. Very cool. All right, man. Well, I will I'll let you get going back to your, your, your life there. Um, but, uh, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Good to meet you.